Hello, everyone. It's Mary Larson, Executive Director of the NAMM Foundation. And wasn't that a beautiful and gentle way and thoughtful way to start our next session? This last year at the NAMM Foundation, we made an important shift. And we made a shift into the realities that music has a stronger voice to play in our social justice conversations. In fact, it may be the starting force and the unifying force for many schools, communities, and extended communities where we are working for the type of world where everyone experiences their own creativity, their own expression, their own identity, their own cultural celebrations, and indeed, maybe we can all understand each other better. And in, in the um, opportunity we had to build our Believe in Music experience, we looked to a very important university in our country, the University of South Carolina, who almost simultaneously as our thought process, uh, actually a lot earlier than our thought process, was entering into this uh, conversation for themselves. And how could a leading national university and school of music create a model of community engagement and community participation that indeed put music and musical experiences at the center of an expanded community dialogue where people could engage, understand, and learn more about each other. So I'm delighted to have with us the Dean and the fac faculty members at the University of South Carolina School of Music, who will take us through their um, very important program that I hope and I believe could serve as a model for so many other university schools of music or even community music schools. I'd like to welcome, please, our, the Dean of the School of Music, University of South Carolina, Dr. Taylor Harding, to take us on the journey of understanding music and the public good, building our bridges at the School of Music, University of South Carolina. Taylor. Thank you, Mary. I'm proud to introduce our school and my colleagues as we present to you today a very important 2020-21 initiative of our comprehensive state flagship music school. We are grateful to NAM, the NAM Foundation, and to the Rolling Corporation for this opportunity, and we're so delighted to share the conception, the content, and realized examples of what we consider to be a seminal aspect of our School of Music, its mission and its vision, the Bridging Our Distances Initiative. You've just seen a moment ago a few minutes of an unusual and unforgettable performance of John Luther Adams' stunning composition, 10,000 Birds, delivered by 19 graduate and undergraduate music students at the University of South Carolina as a part of our award-winning new music series, Southern Exposure. This concert event, our first Bridging Our Distances event this last October, was performed on the 220-year-old historic horseshoe at the center of our amazing campus and was the first live performance event presented for our community in seven months at that time. Over 100 persons attended in a carefully socially distanced environment. Our school is made up of 55 faculty and 480 students at bachelor's, master's, and doctoral levels in traditional music degree areas such as performance, music education, piano pedagogy, composition, theory, music history, conducting. But in the last 15 years, we've developed more distinctive music programs that are unique to us and to how we do them, created through the work of America's only comprehensive music leadership institute located at our school. SPARC, the Music Leadership Laboratory of Carolina, such as music advocacy, entrepreneurship, community engagement, chamber music, music and audio technologies, musical theater, music industry studies, and string pedagogy. The essence of our School of Music since 2005 has been to pursue in our work and our, in our educating of tomorrow's music professionals and music lovers the fundamental premise that these future musicians will need to be skilled to build careers and lives in music that may not and likely do not exist now, and to be prepared by what we can provide them to invent their futures and define success for themselves on their own terms. The future of music in America and society's expectations for musical experiences is demanding this of us. After achieving the initial vision of the school from 2005 to 15 to be a regional model for the preparation of music leaders, 
the faculty of the school in the fall of 2015 defined a new vision to be the nation's model public music school and to achieve that in 10 years. Entitled Vision 2025, this commitment articulated in a strategic plan suggests a variety of new approaches to the work we do in the school imagined and designed around five core values. The first two we consider are conventional values that we execute uniquely, pursuing excellence and assuring student success. And then we have three more of these five values that we consider to be our distinctive values, those that separate us. Creating music leaders, preparing outstanding musician educators, and developing diversely skilled musicians. We manifest these values in all that we do, and many new initiatives and activities, including new curricula, concentrations, minors, ensembles, graduate and undergraduate scholarship and assistantship positions, summer institutes, national symposia, and others. And others also that will come up as we present the Bridging of Our Distances initiative to you today. The most essential of these to achieving the vision of being the model public music school by 2025 is to actualize the principle of using music to improve the public good and advance social justice. We pursue that goal by forming and implementing impactful community engagement programs that we call Music for Your Life. These programs are designed and delivered to assure that the public benefits in multiple ways by the advancement of music and music making opportunities into their neighborhoods and into their walks of life that promote happiness, personal fulfillment, and hope. Not only in those citizens, but also in our School of Music students. When collegiate music students are immersed into community engagement activities like these, their learning through the process becomes not only hands-on, but complete, where the ideas, means, and ends of human enrichment are realized together in real time with audiences and other participants. We have many community engagement initiatives like the eight or so Music for Your Life programs among the constellation of School of Music initiatives. But none is poised to do more to propel our mission and enrich both of us in the school and the members of our community than the Bridging Our Distances initiative. This was formed and launched in September of 2020 to, number one, unite those of us in our society isolated by the pandemic. Number two, to amplify the voices of those whose voices are traditionally underrepresented, undervalued, or unheard. Number three, to celebrate the heroes among us that risk so much to keep us all safe and healthy. And number four, to help us articulate to the world what we know is important in our future, to continue this work and to expand it as our society requires it. With that preface, I'm delighted to introduce to you the director of Bridging Our Distances, our assistant professor of cello, Claire Bryant, who will describe more fully what Bridging Our Distances is and how we're realizing it. Claire. Thank you so much, Taylor. It's an honor to be here on stage with all of you and here with you uh, live uh, with NAM. So thank you so much. Bridging Our Distances is the U of SC School of Music's response to social justice and public health crises we have all been facing together in separation as a society this past year. The design of this broad initiative was for us to reinvigorate our purpose as an institution made up of artist citizens within and beyond the concert hall, seeking meaningful ways of connecting with each other and with our surrounding campus and civic communities through the act of sharing music in this difficult time of isolation and disengagement. A summer task force made up of students, faculty, and staff identified four bridges or four distinct areas, as Taylor was mentioning before. And we agreed that all of these needed the immediate attention and energy during this challenging time. I'd love to go over those again. Our first one is unite communities. We commit to actively sharing music with a wider cross-section of society, transcending the traditional concert hall aiming to repair, strengthen, and unite the communities in which we live. Amplify voices. We commit to programming music that amplifies underrepresented voices. Celebrate heroes. 
We commit to celebrating the unsung heroes who selflessly place themselves on the front lines of the pandemic, reminded that their daily efforts generate the pulse of our society. Spur our future. We commit to spurring forward into the future by activating an array of possibilities rather than relying on past assumptions. In our rapidly changing world, we must help to bridge new paths for our students in response to the world around us. So today we are here to share these components of bridging our distances, which was really our own call to action for ourselves and for our peers and colleagues in our internal community. We will home in on each bridge and share some, some of the clear ways we were able to put these ideals into practice. Now this is a fluid initiative and for us it was less about creating events and ideas from scratch, but more so an opportunity to reframe the things that we were already doing as a School of Music community. However, it also served as a mechanism for sharing and promoting existing events and projects, as well as creating new opportunities for collaboration as we think the, rethink the way we make and share music both within the concert hall and beyond. So two examples of Bridge Number One Unite Communities that I would like to share with you today were designed with different audiences in mind. The first event was an all-day series of outdoor pop-up concerts in the heart of the USC campus. This event took place on the Friday before the election, and it was a way for our students to advocate civic engagement and also remind their peers to vote on November 3rd, 2020. We call this event, Play Your Part, Vote. There was continuous live music from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. filling the air of the campus. But it was essentially the first and only performance for many students during the fall 2020 semester because of the COVID challenges that we are all facing. And we're not able to have live audiences in our building during this time. The lineup was multi-genre from soloist to swing band. And you'll see we had a cello ensemble. We had a woodwind quartet. A solo vocalist had the chance to perform. And we had local media attend and students had the chance to speak to them and tell them why we were doing this. And uh, student government set up advocacy tables so that students could actually figure out where their polling places were. All in all, it was a really, really great day. And uh, the second example I will share with you is, was from a three-day residency on a mobile concert hall called, appropriately, the Concert Truck, which was created by two U of SC School of Music alumni. We gave three performances in the community on the Concert Truck, one at the zoo, one at an outdoor farmer's market, and one at a public school, which you can see here, called the Midlands Arts Conservatory, or MAC. Two U of SC student chamber music ensembles prepared scripted interactive performances for seventh through ninth graders around musical entry points they came up with based on the pieces that they were to perform. You'll see that we were set up in the school parking lot. There were about 50 students and teachers in attendance wearing face coverings and seated six feet apart. But there were also about 100 students attending the performance on Zoom. The first group from USC to perform was a violin cello duo. And they chose the entry point musical texture. And throughout the performance and by way of engaging activities and unpacking sections of the music, the duo successfully introduced the advanced musical concepts of monophony, homophony, and polyphony. Let's hear an, an excerpt from that day now. All right, now next we're going to discuss homophony. Homophony is a little bit more complex it's melody and accompaniment, or chords that are supporting a melodic line. So listen to this example from another one of Gliere's mini pieces, and see if you can figure out which one of us has the melodic line and who is the supporting line.
who has the melodic and who has the supporting line? Go ahead. Yeah, that's correct. That's ding, correct. ding, ding. So the violin part has the melodic line, and Ellis's line supports mine by outlining different chords. And last up, we have polyphony. This community performance proved to be so needed, not just for the public school students, but for our students and faculty. Let's hear from one of the student performances that day about how this experience was meaningful to her. Hi there, my name is Ellis, and I'm a student of Professor Bryant's here at the University of South Carolina. I was pleased to be a part of the initiative in which we worked with Mac students this past semester as you just saw, this educational engagement performance was exciting, fun, interactive, safe, and a great experience for all involved. But above all else, this performance was representative of the ways in which community and university can unite, that we can build the bridge between us and come together as one to uplift us all. I am pleased to be a part of an initiative that supports and fosters growth in our youth and I look forward to the ways in which these youth continue to thrive through the bond that we have created with the university and our wonderful Columbia community. Thank you, Ellis. Very well said. So these are just two examples of ways we were able to support our students and encourage community engagement through these safe public performances with musical connections and interactions for our campus and local audiences. This banner of uniting communities flows naturally into bridge number two, our wish and commitment to amplify voices. So I will now turn it over to one of our talented graduate assistants and student leaders, Jamal Nicholas. Thank you, Professor Bryant, and to everyone joining us this evening, uh, thank you for spending this uh, evening with us as we share. The School of Music's endeavor to bridge physical and metaphorical distances within and beyond our musical and social community is multifaceted, and as mentioned by Dean Harding and Professor Bryant, includes our commitment to amplifying underrepresented voices in music. By programming the music of historically and presently marginalized groups of people, we aspire to spread awareness of divergent voices in music, bolster equity in our field, champion the diversity of both global and American music, and underscore the unique and distinctive sounds of our home, South Carolina. In the fall of 2020, our ensembles were challenged with social distancing measures and COVID-19 mitigation protocols, which precluded traditional rehearsal and performance opportunities. Not to be discouraged, however, ensemble members at the University of South Carolina programmed, rehearsed, recorded, and edited virtual performances entirely remotely, many of which served our aim of amplifying voices. One such example of our commitment to amplifying voices was the virtual performance of Omar Thomas's Mother of a Revolution by members of both the Wind Ensemble and some phonic winds here at the University of South Carolina. In 2019, Omar Thomas, a black LGBTQIA composer and professor of composition and jazz studies at the University of Texas at Austin, wrote Mother of a Revolution, which celebrates the lives of trans women and is a personal tribute to Marsha P. Johnson, who was a central instigator of the Stonewall Riots of 1969 which greatly advanced the cause of gay rights in America. Omar Thomas's intersectionality and composition as both a black man and member of the LGBTQIA community, coupled with his compositional tribute to Marsha P. Johnson and trans, trans women around the world, renders this an excellent illustration of our commitment to amplifying underrepresented voices in music. In this case, through both the composer and the subject matter about which the music was written. Please enjoy this brief excerpt of Omar Thomas's Mother of a Revolution. Thank you. 
Thank you. While virtual performance has indisputably risen to unprecedented prominence during COVID-19, our commitment to bridging physical distances through live performance beyond the concert hall and amplifying underrepresented voices in music through divergent programming is unwavering. Last semester, wind and string faculty at the School of Music presented an outdoor concert in the center of campus that featured the music of Valerie Coleman and Jeff Scott in tribute to Richard T. Greener, the first African-American professor at the University of South Carolina and the first black graduate of Harvard College. I will also mention that both Coleman and Scott are black composers and members of the Grammy-nominated Imani Winds, founded by Valerie Coleman herself, which further manifests our commitment to amplifying voices. Here is an excerpt of Valerie Coleman's Glory, an original work commissioned by the U of SC School of Music in tribute to Professor Richard T. Greener. This outdoor concert served dual functions, both as an amplifier for marginalized voices and as a tribute to the often unsung heroes, healthcare professionals, and essential workers who have kept us healthy and our society operating amid a global health crisis, but who do not always re receive the recognition they so richly de deserve. Our celebration of these treasured heroes is reflected in both our efforts to create safe concert experiences and in more direct efforts to acknowledge and applaud their selfless and tireless work, without which we would not be able to continue creating and sharing music. That said, it is now my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Blair Mothersbaugh, who will share more details of our third bridge, Celebrate Heroes. Thank you, Jamal, and thank you to everyone joining us here this evening. As Jamal said, my name is Blair Mothersbaugh, and I'm a graduate assistant here in the Spark Music Leadership Laboratory and the Music Entrepreneurship Program. What Jamal was just saying is absolutely correct. This past year or so, we've really seen those people and those professions that make our society run and that are essential to our society particularly since our states and our society started opening up again and trying to find what this new normal is, they've become all the more essential. So our team in the entrepreneurship program sat down at the start of the year, and really over the summer even, and we thought about, okay, how can we recognize these people? How can we elevate their stories and their voices so that they're better heard, they're better understood, and better appreciated? We thought of all sorts of possibilities, a benefit concert of some sort, concerts with specific dedications, a more inclusive and programmatic approach to repertoire for our ensembles. But really what we ended up running into every time, the problem was traditionally most music events are held indoors. The audience comes to us in a space something like this, a recital hall, a concert hall. Obviously, that's not an option right now, not in this time that we're in, not in this new normal. So we were faced with, okay, how do we do this safely so that the impact is still felt, but without jeopardizing the very people and the very professions that we're trying to elevate and trying to celebrate? And eventually, this video shows what we came up with.
As COVID-19 forced communities to shut down, some neighbors suddenly found themselves on the front lines of a public health disaster. Whether out of necessity or a sense of duty, these essential workers kept showing up, despite often little recognition and great personal peril. To recognize these champions and their industries, the University of South Carolina School of Music is spearheading celebrating local heroes with the concert truck. Our hope is to pay tribute while providing a better understanding of their circumstances, sacrifice, and courage. This project involves 10 heroes, 10 musical ensembles, 10 composers, and a concert truck. We begin with hero interviews, seeking to learn about their work and life, challenges faced, moments of triumph, and thoughts on the future. Ultimately, each of these will be boiled down to a two to three minute vignette video to be scored by our composers and recorded by the assigned ensemble. We'll also schedule 10 outdoor concerts, each at locations meaningful to one of the heroes, featuring three musical acts, speakers, and a premiere showing of the vignette video. The culminating event weaves together all 10 heroes, our university president, and more, emphasizing that we are all in this together. Performances take place aboard the concert truck, a mobile venue that fosters a more inclusive, empathetic world by redefining the modern concert hall. The concert truck is an entrepreneurial initiative dreamed up by two U of SC alum when they were still students. Our hope is that the Concert Truck Community Heroes helps us better empathize with neighbors while leveraging the power of music to celebrate our community. So once the idea of the Concert Truck was floated, that was it. And that became the medium or the vehicle, if you'll pardon the pun, for bringing the concert to these people instead of bringing them to the concert, we'd take the music to them. And as we've seen, and as Claire talked about a little bit earlier, the concert truck is just that. It's a box truck that opens up and a stage slides out with a piano and space for more ensembles. The idea came while two School of Music alumni, Susan Zhang and Nick Luby, were still in school here. And it's really a beautifully simple way to reimagine the concert hall. Just put it on wheels. Because our concerts could now be mobile, as I said, we could tailor them to each profession and each individual and bring the concert to them in their environment. Now, there are a lot of moving parts to this project, and I wanted to break them down and understand how they work a little bit more. We went through a long process of back and forth about what professions were we going to honor. Were we somehow implying that the ones that didn't make the list were less essential than the ones that did? Of course not, but we only had so much space. We went through a, a rigorous selection process involving all levels of the School of Music, from the students to the administrative leadership. And the 10 we came up with are nursing, emergency room doctors, emergency medical technicians, or EMTs, teachers and educators, custodial and service employees, delivery chain, restaurant and hospitality, mental health care professionals, grocery employees, and artists of all types. And once we had those 10 professions, we, f we went through and we found an individual who represents each profession. So then the second group, the student ensembles, we really wanted to make this totally inclusive and a total school-wide event and get involvement on every level. We focused on student groups and tried to get ensembles that we knew would not only be passionate about the project, but would also represent all instrumentations that the school has to offer. So we have everything from a, uh, a percussion ensemble to a string quartet, from a mixed instrumentation collective to a vocal group and even a jazz combo. Every ensemble, as we saw in the video, is paired with an individual hero to help form a relationship and get to know their story a little better, to learn more about them and allow that to influence the ensemble's involvement in the project. Then the question became, okay, do we just do a series of concerts? Is there a lasting effect from that? Is that enough? Or could we create something that would appeal to a wider audience and that would really get the stories, the heroes' stories out into the world further? So we brought on board a documentary team from here in Columbia, as we saw, to gather footage and shoot interviews to make short videos about each of our heroes. 
Now every good video needs a good soundtrack, and that's where our composers come in. We sent out a call, and we ended up with a great group of School of Music student composers and alumni of the school. They'll each write a short piece to underscore this video, which will be recorded by the assigned ensemble. All of this, all these moving parts, culminate and combine into one amazing residency in late March. The concert truck will be here in town, all over Columbia and the greater Columbia area, and our student ensembles will all perform in a concert honoring their hero at their hero's location. Our hope is to obviously target their place of employment for the primary audience and to give them the thanks and really recognize the superhuman contributions that they've been making for the past 12 months. It hasn't really been an intuitive process, I'll say, but then again, nothing about our world right now seems to be intuitive. Um, so it became less about what are we doing as a school this year and more about keeping at the center the message and the story and the impact of these heroes. And really by allowing ourselves to get outside of the School of Music building and into the community, we opened up a world of new possibilities, a world of new ways to engage with music. And that, I think, is the perfect place to pass it off back to Dean Harding to talk about the fourth pillar of bridging our distances. Thank you, Blair. The bridge Spur Our Future actualizes our school's intention to focus on and invest in new programming and new activities that will advance the school's potential to bridge distances, create ever more prepared graduates, and have an increasingly positive effect on our communities by facilitating a greater impact on the public good. This developing focus and investment is based upon three principles. First, we must remain consistent with our five core values. Number two, we need to structure administrative and external giving priorities to support the new programming and activities. And number three, we must mindfully connect the components of the School of Music and Spark Music Leadership study and application with the goals of bridging our distances. The components of this music leadership study and application are advocacy, entrepreneurship, and community engagement. We aim to develop this new programming and these new activities through two means. By advancing the use of evolving technologies in all School of Music work, and by implementing new curricular courses and co-curricular ventures. Here are just a few examples of how we advance use of evolving technologies in all School of Music work with each of our music leadership components. With advocacy, we now provide distance education applications so that students can have the opportunity to engage in national policy discussions and debates with experts and legislators. Just two days ago, on the Coalition of Coalitions meeting webinar at the Believe in Music Week at NAM, we had several of our students engaging with that through distance education applications right here in Columbia. For entrepreneurship, we are designing live performance activities for professional and amateur music making utilizing established online platforms, Jamulus, Jam Kazam, Soundtrap, and doing it in real time. With community engagement, the use of the disc clavier and other interactive instrumental devices has become paramount and central to much of what we do in the school. These photos that we have right here of the use of the disc clavier uh, manifest a, a variety of different ways that that particular interactive instrument can benefit all sorts of populations musically. We use it in many ways, but in two very startling ways as it relates to spurring our future in the Bridging Our Distances initiative. One is through piano pedagogy online to different locations around the world with pianos that can talk to each other in real time. And another, where we actually use the instrument as a performance instrument located in one room in our building, but piped into this very recital hall as an accompanying instrument for students that are giving recitals without an accompanist right next to them. We have some examples of new curricular courses and co-curricular adventures as well. In advocacy, 
student faculty and alumni participation in school-sponsored state and neighborhood policy-making actions are advanced through two new advocacy courses in our curriculum. Here are a couple of photos of students and faculty engaging in some of that neighborhood and state policy-making action advocacy on behalf of the power of music and music education. With respect to entrepreneurship, we have something now called su supplemental applied instruction that's a part of each of our new degree concentrations. Supplemental applied instruction is where students in these degree concentrations register not only for their primary performing medium, voice or instrument, but they also register for a secondary applied, a supplemental applied, one semester out of their time in their program and take a half hour lesson each week or two hour lessons every other week, either one-on-one -on -one or sometimes in small class settings with a member of our faculty who's teaching a topic of their interest and specialty that goes beyond their own instrumental or vocal applied teaching. And some of the examples of that are advanced breathing techniques, uh, experimental in improvisation, mindfulness in practice, advanced microtonality and intonation techniques, the founding and sustaining of new music ensembles, and then one that is not uncommon among young people today all over the country, all over the world, who are learning how to turn their own musical skills into not just making music by themselves, but by using looping technologies to make a whole band by themselves live and in real time. We have students here that do that too. But we have one whose video I would like to show you now, a doctoral oboe student named Pedro Falcon, who's using what he learned in supplemental applied instruction from our base professor, Craig Butterfield, who teaches supplemental applied in looping techniques to build this quite stunning arrangement of a Venezuelan gabon for a whole band, all of the creation of Pedro's in real time with a looping machine. Final example I'd like to give of a new course or curricular activity with one of our music leadership components that's spurring our future as a part of bridging our distances has to do with community engagement. Our SPARC led grant programs for faculty and students to design and implement new one time events or new ongoing endeavors that realize the principles of each of the first three bridges are being sustained as a part of our effort. One is a Heroes Project. It is likely that we'll have another Heroes Project similar to the one we're doing, but in the fall with different heroes. 
an Amplify Voices activity, music and multi-arts collaborations designed with and delivered with local historically black college and universities and black artists to work with new audiences and participants in expanded neighborhoods and some more Unite Communities efforts in music making with a variety of communities that we serve, including disadvantaged populations and the incarcerated. Like our program with Lee Correctional Institution, you will see now as I pass the mic off to all three of my colleagues. Thank you, Taylor. I'd love to give a little background on how Lee and USC found each other. Before I joined the U of SC faculty in the fall of 2019, a chamber music collective I co-founded called Decoda had established an annual collaborative songwriting program at South Carolina's largest maximum security prison, Lee Correctional Institution in Bishopville, South Carolina. The men living in the character-based dorm at Lee run their own music program. And over the past eight years, Dakota has been able to help shine a light on their accomplishments by presenting week-long collaborative songwriting workshops that have yielded over 175 original songs of multi-genre. And three of their songs, Dakota even performed at the White House in 2015 at an event entitled Innovation and the Arts, Prison Reform and Reentry in the 21st Century. Decoda, though, has not been able to supply the vital supplementary curriculum, support, and engagement throughout the year as the ensemble is not physically based in South Carolina. So I approached Taylor a few years ago about the possibility of the School of Music becoming a partner to the Prisons Music Program. And being the person that Taylor is and the leader that he is, he said yes and immediately committed two of our esteemed faculty to the project. Professor of Oboe and Associate Dean for Community Engagement and Experiential Learning, Rebecca Nagel, and Associate Professor of Music Theory, Danny Jenkins. Over the past four years, the School of Music has offered distance learning courses at the prison in areas of beginning music theory, advanced music theory, composition, and vocal skills. In addition, some, of, some U of SC students have participated in songwriting workshops with the residents at Lee. These songwriting projects culminate in an on-site, side-by-side -side concert inside Lee Correctional for other members of the incarcerated population, officers and staff, South Carolina Department of Corrections leadership, residents, families, and members of our School of Music community. The purpose of these programs is education through music, but the result is much, much more than that. It is a powerful and transformative union for the incarcerated participants, the correctional officers and st staff, and for our students and faculty. I think it goes without saying to all of you that music has powers which transcend the tangible. Both Jamal and Blair have had the opportunity to make and perform music with the residents and, and musicians at Lee. And I'd love to ask Jamal if he would be willing to share uh, how that experience was for you. Yes, absolutely. It was a fantastic experience and it was positively transcendent uh, to your point. You know, that section of the population, uh, members, uh, residents at a correctional facility, is not one with which I have much familiarity, but it was especially powerful for me to see that they are individuals with unique experience and talents and uh, perspectives on life that uh, we don't often get to experience and share with and interact with. So it was powerful for me just to be there and, and get to see them for the humans that they are. Um, and I, I think I got as much, uh, at least, if not more, than they got out of it with, uh, for us being there. Uh, my most salient memory of, of the experience was one with uh, one of the residents named King, who after he observed us perform uh, Mozart's Serenade Number no. 12, came up to me after and said, you know, I've never seen a black man doing that. I've never seen a black man conducting like that. And that was really special and transformative and powerful for me to experience that. Thank you, Jamal. Um, thanks for sharing that powerful story and your experience with us. And it's a necessary reminder that the arts have a tremendous impact on our communities and are vital for all of us, but especially to those who are forgotten by our society and are desperately seeking reform, the human connection, empathy, and hope. So we would like to share with you two very short audio excerpts 
from a recent songwriting project led by members of our faculty. U of SC students from theory classes and concert, the concert band worked remotely with the Lee musicians for an entire semester to create new songs based on Leonard Bernstein's mass. The first excerpt exhibits the guts that it takes to try something new, whether you are new to music or a veteran of music. And you're going to hear a rendition of the Soli Deo Gloria written and performed by the incarcerated musicians alongside U of SC students. And what you'll hear is a, a, a Lee resident rapping for the first time. And then the second verse is a U of SC student spitting a verse for the first time. Let us hear an excerpt from Soli Deo Gloria. The second clip and our final clip is from a group anthem written by and performed by the men and their house band and our students at U of SC. And it's called, We Are Not Ashamed. And I think it really conveys the sense of unity, togetherness, and understanding this partnership cultivates. We are not ashamed. Thank you, Claire. I'd like to finish our presentation by making sure I say two important things. First, I wish to again thank my partners on the stage here this afternoon, Claire and Jamal and Blair. I'd like to thank NAM and the NAM Foundation, my colleague Mary Lorson, Claire Crager Boaz, and their staff, and our generous and visionary sponsor, the Rowling Corporation. I offer my sincere and enduring appreciation to all our folks here at South Carolina that have helped put all of this production and the Bridging Our Distances initiative itself together. Our faculty, our staff, our fantastic students, our donors, and most especially the personnel in our Spark Music Leadership Lab, Rachel Calloway, David Cutler, Jeff Vaughn, and their graduate assistants, as well as our marketing and communication folks, Micah Decker and Chip Wade. And most poignantly, I wish to express my undying gratitude to our amazing recording engineer and producer of this live event, a real champion and necessary companion in our work here at Carolina, Jeff Francis. I'll close our presentation for the day, making sure to re-articulate our South Carolina collective commitment to invest in and practice the power of music to bring fulfillment and hope to our societal efforts to advance the observance of social justice and enhance the public good, as well as to issue this call to action to all our stakeholders. I implore each of you and each of the institutions, corporations, and organizations you represent 
to make a similar investment and commitment to use your musical influence to positively impact a future where justice and the blessings of liberty are observed for every American. Thank you. Stage at the uh, at the recital hall at the University of South Carolina. And Taylor, I want to, I want that last comment to just breathe a moment um, because what you've provided for us is such a comprehensive example of of hard work in this area. So we're going to take a few minutes. Uh, we have about 12 minutes together. And uh, we're getting some questions across the transom, and I'd love to uh, ask ask um, ask a few questions. So um, I'll start out by you are all uh, uh, as the dean, a faculty member, and graduate students. How do you think a program, this bridging bridging our distances program, or maybe there would be other programs and other school of music that has these elements? How do you think this program will change? the experience of the music students coming through your doors? How do you think they will enter into their study knowing that this, uh, your environment and your purpose has, has expanded in this way? I'd welcome any, any of you to jump in with your thoughts. I'm gonna speak first, but only to point to some, someone else to speak because I, when this kind of question gets asked, um, the last thing we need is to have the old people set out the expectations and then ask the young people to figure out whether or not they're meeting them. So I'm going to just say that I want to hear from Blair and Jamal and Claire, too, on that incredibly wonderful question, Mary. I'll jump in, I guess. Um, I guess the best way that I could say this is I noticed right away I'm at the end of my second year here at USC, and I noticed right away within the first month or so that I was here starting my degree that everything I was working on in all my classes, in my lessons, my ensembles, it all had a direct application somewhere out in the world. It wasn't just, oh, I'm going to put together a recital or a concert and then sit on stage and have an audience come see it. And there is merit in that, don't get me wrong, that there are wonderful things that come from that, and there's merit and truth in that. But everything that I ended up doing and everything that was presented to me had this component out there in the real world somewhere. So I was immediately working with and affecting and being affected by other people outside the School of Music. Um, and I think that, that ties into the Spur Our Future very nicely is that the future is not in the building. The future is out there wherever we, wherever we make it and with who, whomever we make the future. If I could just follow up, Blair, with you for a moment. Um, so in your study then, was this an unexpected turn? It in, was in unexpected essence? how much, to it, the degree was unexpected to what degree it was happening. Um, and we were talking about this a little bit before the session started. There are other music schools out there that are doing amazing things and pioneering things, of course. But, and maybe we're a little biased because we're all here at USC, but it doesn't, it doesn't seem, and to me, starting my degree, it didn't seem like anybody else was doing the number of things and the scope and the breadth and the depth of things that we are here at Carolina. And that's really what blew me away is that there was ev around every corner and in every conversation, there was a new opportunity and a new project and a new thing to go chase out there in the world. So I think what really surprised me was how much it was happening, not that it was happening at all. So it sounds to me like it really expanded your horizons about what was possible. Oh, absolutely. And it's still expanding and, and, my horizons. And I think that goes back to the basic question. I'd love to hear from Jamal, too, on that question. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, what, what Blair said kind of touched on most of it. But what is most um, special and powerful to me is the degree to which we sort of break down this barrier between the ivory tower or the, ac the academy and the public. There are people with very rich, very real, 
experiences beyond the, the scope of the concert hall. And I think that the initiatives that we have going on here are especially well tailored and suited to uh, creating a dialogue between us and the public and inviting those experiences in. And we don't always see that uh, in, you know, inside of the academy. It's sort of like the sage on the stage sort of thing. You come to us and we will, we will fill you with all of the expertise and music that we have and you'll sit and take it and clap for us. And it's not like that here. You know, we, we invite, we, uh, we encourage experiences beyond traditional academic settings to enhance what we do here. Based on the, the solid core values that Taylor talked about at the beginning, you know, it is, it's still an atmosphere of musical excellence, right? Based on that, it's just uh, really expanding that. Um, uh, Claire, uh, I'd love your answer to that as well from, from your perspective, but, and then I'd like to follow up with uh, a, a little bit of a nitty gritty on the realities of running such a thing. But how do you think this program has expanded the students that are working in your studio? Um, well, thanks to Jamal and Blair for those answers. It's just, it's, it's awesome um, to hear that. And I'm fairly new to USC, um, but the reason I came here was because of exactly what Jamal and Blair uh, just said. Um, there are so many like-minded people here within the faculty, staff, and student body that um, I think we're just, this kind of initiative is just a way to um, bring all of those amazing things that are happening within different studios and different departments and bring them together so that we can learn from one another and be inspired by one another. Um, and in my studio, for, I mean, I think also it was, you know, um, the, the, the crises that we were facing um, as a nation and as a world this, this year, we needed something to actually bring us together. And so that was the impetus for bridging our distances, but it's become much more than that because I think we're seeing a longevity um, it, it, because we the, the substance of uh, the different bridges is, is so vital to um, our society, but also to the future of our students' lives out in the world. It's not just enough to be able to to you know walk on stage and play play pretty. Um, that's and that's not really what it's about um, for me and I think uh, for, for all of us I think we're discovering that through um, share this this uh, platform helps us to share uh, ideas and, and possibilities um, for my studio I, I just love um, my students and you got to hear from one of them Ellis I mean and, and she just I, I you know, uh, she just jumped to the to the task of of getting on to the concert truck, which is not you know you have to get used to playing on a truck. You're, who's who's had experience doing that? Um, but but also to to she's a freshman and she and her partner wrote a, an extremely engaging um, interactive performance that the students at Mac were just. Um, having so much fun with and and right away creating that relationship. The fourth wall is gone. Um, so I just couldn't be more pleased uh, to be where I am um, today. Yeah, that's wonderful. Taylor, would you like to, um, now you feel more comfortable answering that question, possibly, as the dean? Yeah, I, unfortunately, I could go on for a long time on this subject. Uh, but I'll just say a, a, a couple of things. Um, I think part of the reason why, and Claire hit on this, uh, 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 we have kind of a special sauce at Carolina on this matter, um, largely not only because we have great faculty like Claire that we're hiring all the time anew who are buying into this vision before they ever even sign on to coming to or even apply to the school. The same thing with graduate students like Jamal and Blair. Blair mentioned he, he knew we did this. It's part of the reason that he came. He just didn't know he would be overwhelmed with it. Um, I think it's not just the people, it's also the fact that the people, we're located in a place where we're connected to Lee, where we have all sorts of great uh, communities that need us right beyond our walls. We have an institution that values music as, as highly as any flagship in America values music on their campus. Um, we have donors who are buying in in a big way to this new world that we're uh, forging ahead with. 
Um, and I just, I, that's the special sauce. I'd also just like to quickly say that um, I think one of the reasons why that this is so important and at the genesis of your question, Mary, is that it isn't just about student experience and student learning. We know that that's essential. We've been talking about this in music in higher ed and professional music circles since the Ford Foundation gave the first check to the New York Philharmonic. I mean, we've been having these conversations for decades, so we know that professional musicians of tomorrow need to be trained differently than they were yesterday. The real kicker is that not only do music schools need to do that, but society needs music worse than it's ever needed music ever. And so if society needs music worse than it's ever needed it, and the public good is demanding music, and we're the ones that can provide it with these great young people, like I said at our summit a few years ago, those things intersect with us. And so the, I, every single member of the community here feels a responsibility to this, and it's not just a joyful thing that we go home loving, even though it is that, it's also this huge responsibility right in the midst of, of an inauguration that reminds us that everything is possible. We practice a whole concept of music with music, everything is possible. Again, I want to let that breathe a little bit. Um, you know, we've talked about this work is not necessarily a, um, a tool set, it's a mindset, right? And when musicians can come in and continue to train and continue to hone their, their remarkable skills, that they're in, in an environment where those skills feel more relevant to them. That's, I think, what, what I'm sensing. Yeah. There's an expanding relevance of the role of the musician in the world. Um, you know, I was so taken by the audio recordings from the, uh, incarcerated, the incarcerated musicians you just can't help but uh, uh, feel that there's, a, there's layers and layers and layers of life going on there that your experience with them is helping to unfold. Um, any, final, any final thoughts of um, what's it? I, we're closing in on time and there's a few, few more questions that I'd love to share, but any final thoughts on, on what's next for this great project? Uh, Claire is the, is the leader of this. What do you hope for next? Well, um, you know, this is fluid and we're, uh, we're in our second semester of Bridging Our Distances and it's really exciting because it feels like it's, it's really leaping off the ground. And I think we're, um, I know for me personally, having um, been able to um, so luckily uh, bring the Lee Correctional Institution into the hands of Taylor and the fabulous professors here that were, uh, cultivating and taking care of and nurturing that program. I, I look forward to rekindling that program post COVID. Obviously we can't be in the institution right now. Um, I know that de the Department of Corrections is, is um, constantly wanting to um, find ways of uh, creating more sustainable programs um, that have an educational base. And I think we have a great relation, relationship with them. And for me, that's that kind of experience as Jamal you know, shared with us. I mean, I remember the first time I went to a prison and I will not forget it and it changed my life. So I think every student should have that opportunity um, because it's a part of our society. These are people, these are human beings, and um, they have very much uh, to say. And I think sharing music, that, that is, a, that is a, um, I think, the most um, powerful way to share music in an environment that we know nothing about necessarily, um, but we're able to get past all of those preconceptions and those um, and, and just get to the music. Um, so for me, the Lee, the Lee connection is, is, is going to expand, I hope, but um, we're really looking forward to um, the March residency. We're uh, going to launch some YouTube videos this semester so that our students, um, they have so much to say as well, and they really wanna connect with um, uh, the community out there. Thank so you. I'm getting the time cut. Sorry yes. about that. 
That's all right. Thank you. And thank you to our great panel and our wonderful folks in Columbia, South Carolina, University of South Carolina School of Music, bridging our dis distances. You can go to the session page and interact with our uh, panelists if so desired, if they wish to jump on that page. It's in the Zoom link and we can send it on to you. So thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful time here at Belize. Thanks for joining us.